Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. So the topic of this talk is post-quantum cryptography. So this is again a talk in the area of uh, cryptography. And as you've seen with uh, Philip's talk just a moment ago, there's lots of areas where we're using cryptography already. He mentioned the FBI versus Apple case. And you might not actually be aware all the time you're using crypto. We all are users of cryptography just by browsing the internet, using our cards to view bank transactions. If you're using Facebook, WhatsApp, or your iPhone, then you're already using cryptography. Now, I hope that several of you, because you hear dot security, are using a little bit extra. So if you're using PGP or if you're using one of the more secure uh, operating systems, then you're actually aware you're using it. So this line of, of work, then you're fully aware that you're using cryptography, you're using security, and you want to do it. The other ones is really like, well, anybody in the world is using it as soon as they're doing anything electronically. Now, when you look in your browser, there's this little lock icon, and if people ask me like, hey, Tanya, what do you work on? I say like, well, not exactly, but if you look at that icon and you look at all these three or four letter abbreviations there, that's my job. This is my job to get those working, to make sure that those are secure. Now, what you're seeing there, uh, you might often see RSA, you might see DH, which stands for Diffie Hellman, or you might see something that Sylvain already mentioned, namely elliptic curves. So that's currently used cryptography, and we are seeing more and more of this being deployed. So actually, that's good news. Security is getting better. But of course, there's also lots of bugs. If you listen to the previous talks, make sure to do secure development. Don't get extra bugs in there. It's hard enough to get the crypto right. Please make sure the implementations are secure. And then on top of this, we don't have actually secure hardware. So even if your code is perfectly correct, we don't know whether somebody has done uh, well a glitch in the hardware or let alone backdoors that uh, Philip was just mentioning. That was the happy part of the talk. Now, if you think this is scary, this is much more scary. This is really damn scary because this thing is Shaw's algorithm and Shaw's algorithm is something which breaks all those things with the three or four letter abbreviations. Shaw's algorithm is breaking RSA. Shaw's algorithm is breaking Diffie-Hellman in all the versions that we know, whether it's fine fields, elliptic curves, all of those are broken, broken, dead. So all kind of use cryptography on the internet, on your smartphone, everywhere is dead as soon as anybody builds a big quantum computer. So what I'm talking about today is what can we do now? Well, there's a lot of research effect, uh, efforts to build big quantum computers. If you're looking around, there's a very nice timeline on Wikipedia. People are maintaining this. You see big, big progress. Like 10 years ago, you couldn't even ask when do we have a quantum computer? People would say, well, we have tiny little things and we're all laughing about the factorization of 15, so quantum computers, yeah, okay, not so scary. I mean, Shaw's algorithm, super cool research, but we're not gonna see this in our lifetime, right? Well, now actually we have big industry players, say IBM, leaning out the window and saying it's gonna be another 10, 15 years. That's getting very close. This is nothing where you can say, oh, I'll retire before that. I mean, I see in the audience here, you're mostly younger, so you won't retire anyway. But if I give this to the CEOs, the CISOs, and they go like, yeah, well, 30 years, I ain't going to be retired. No worries. We're now talking 10, 15 years. So all the stuff that we're doing in the first part of a handshake like TLS or when you're using the iPhone, all of those can be broken. There's a little bit more that you're doing if you're looking at your lists, and last year you've seen Ankanto here talking about symmetric key cryptography, that is also affected by quantum computers, but less so. So if you'd have something where we kindly take a large number, say 2 to the 128, then a quantum computer will take 2 to the 64. So that's significantly smaller, but it's something we can control. We can do the same thing the same AS, well, we call then AS-256 instead of AS-128, and then we get the 128 that we wanted there. So we're kind of good. But the first part, the handshake, what we call public key cryptography, that's going to be dead and smashed once a quantum computer is there. So if we don't have public key cryptography, what can we do? Uh, we can do some physical security. We can do, like get people more to flying, and uh, I hear some people are frequent flyers, so we'll be happily volunteering to do the career service for you. Take a big briefcase. You're going to have your key material for the next week on this. Well, better lock it to the wrist because, well, might get lost. Um, and then you're flying this person over with the key material for the data center for one week, and then next week he's coming again, next week coming again. This is nothing that I could do. 
This is basically information protection for rich people. This is not for you and me. This is for some people who really need it. This is the people who have the red phone on your desk. But that's not replacing cryptography for the internet. This is really a problem because we don't have this on internet scale. We can't send people with suitcases around for my data, for your data. This is also like it's proven secure because nobody can see inside the suitcase except for, well, it's just the padlock with key one, two, three, four. Um, so there are lots of ways to screw this up. It's really hard to audit. It's hard to, hard to figure out that there are no backdoors because, hey, maybe somebody has an extra key for it, like all these nice TSA logs, as you see. And furthermore, the functionality is not really what you want. How do you do operating system updates with a suitcase? How do you send certificates with a suitcase? So something that in cryptography we call public key signatures that you're seeing on the internet all the time when you're checking your certificates in the browser, that is something we cannot do with physical security. Now, is there any hope? Yeah, well, <laughs> the title of the talk is Post-Quantum Cryptography, and that's kind of the part that we're dealing with. So Post-quantum cryptography is cryptography where we assume that our attacker has a quantum computer. So in our security model, we're assuming that our attacker is super, super powerful and has the thing already or will have it in five years when the data is still fresh. And we started advertising this area, like trying to sensitize people. We need to think about this. Back in 2006, we had a first workshop. It was like a somewhat small gathering of like 40 people or so. Um, it's been going on, there's been more and more post-quantum crypto conferences, and that's like the 2014 edition, that's a lot more than 40 people. Finally, some money coming in, so uh, we got an EU project, so finally, after <coughs> nine years of saying, guys, there's something happening, we need to do something, finally we got some funding from the EU. Um, well, it's not just us saying this, there's also other people. So there was one NSA announcement that was kind of very visible, summer 2015, the NSA kind of woke up and said, uh, something is happening. Uh, we are aware that something is happening and somebody must transition to post-quantum soon. I think the PR team went after them and said, guys, you can't write this. So a few days later, they kind of quietly changed it. You can still find this on the Wayback Machine on the internet. Uh, now it says we will initiate, so the NSA will lead the, uh, the way to secure post-quantum cryptography. So kind of this gives me this feeling there. They came late, they're like 10 years late, and then they botched the grand entrance. Another problem is, now we have some people saying, oh, the NSA says use post-quantum cryptography, so it must be backdoored. Okay, leaving the tinfoil hats at home, let's do something more productive. So we're getting it into mainstream area. It's now one of the big topics in cryptography. So we had more than 200 people at the last conference. And actually, if you want to get into this, there's now a call for submission by NIST, the National Institute for St uh, Standards and Technology of the US. And they are asking for people to submit something. So it's going to be another five years till we have a standard. But at least people are getting more and more aware. So I know that Etsy, the European Telecoms um, Standards Institute, ISO, and so on, they're now all saying, oops, we must do something about post-quantum cryptography. We must do something so that the threat of quantum computers is dealt with. Now, what do these 200 people do? When we're doing cryptography, we start from something like a math algorithm. We're thinking like, what is hard? Joseph Bonneau earlier mentioned, okay, that computing square roots takes longer than squaring something. That's like one of an example where something has different costs going one way than the other way. So when we're designing crypto systems, we are building something based on cryptographic one-way function, on computational assumptions. And we're now looking at computational assumptions that are also hard for a quantum computer. Because the RSA and diffie hellman and all of the curved diffie hellman versions that we've seen, they are not secure against a quantum computer. So when we build a crypto system, there's lots of stages where we're exploring, where we're trying to figure out what is hard, trying to figure out like how hard is it for an attacker. Then we're going for, is it usable? Can we build a crypto system out of this? The world is littered with crypto systems or attempts at crypto system where somebody said, hey, my math course says this is hard. Let me build something around it. But we're often getting the trapdoors wrong because you need to get something which is easy for the one who has a key and hard for the others. So then we need to take the good ones, implement, see that they actually work, see that 
we can do this in the side channel secure version, so get the implementations right, integrate it into protocols, because some of those systems look quite different from the crypto that you're currently using. You can't just say, hey, I take my RSA, the one that I'm currently using, and I plug in one of the newfangled systems. So there's lots and lots of steps. So as an example, elliptic curve cryptography came out in 1985. It took them 30 years to see widespread uh, deployment. 2015, we're finally seeing elliptic curve cryptography take over the internet. That's 30 years. So we sure cannot wait till we have a quantum computer to start research on it. If the 1980s look a little far away for you, that was the 1980s. That's elliptic curve cryptography. Now, that was the good part of the story. If you have any data that is still interesting 10, 15 years from now, if you have something which requires long-term confidentiality, then you have to be concerned about the attack of quantum computers already now. So how do we deal with this? How can we build something where we can guarantee, say, health data, legal proceedings, my email, if I care about it long enough, I don't want people to be able to read this 30 years from now. Now, when we started giving these talks, like back 2006 or so, people were like, <laughs> you're paranoid. How would anybody get your emails? Do you think that they are watching? Do you think they are listening? Do you think they're recording it? Well, yeah, they are watching. Yeah, they are recording. There's big data centers all over the world that are taking every single bit of encrypted communication that's out there and storing it. Now, if this data is encrypted with public key cryptography, and that's all we're seeing right now, there is some component that a quantum computer can break. So if they have your TLS connection, if you're visiting a secure website today, 21st of April 2017, we don't have a quantum computer yet, so we believe. They can just go back to what randomness your computer was using on the 21st of April 2017 and just go back to today by breaking the crypto with a quantum computer and then they can read everything you've been doing. So by storing all the information, all the communication data, they can actually go back in time and figure out what you have. So that's a problem for everything where you have long-term confidentiality. Now, for signatures, so for website certificates, for your code updates and so on, the feeling is, well, signatures, it only matters the moment you're accepting a signature. It doesn't matter whether in five years somebody has a quantum computer. If today I'm accepting a signature and we don't have a quantum computer, it's a good signature. Now, that's true. But the problem is, we will not get a memo the day that somebody built a quantum computer. Well, it uh, depends on where you're working. Maybe some of you will get a memo. I won't get a memo. There will not be a news article. Oh, some researchers built a big quantum computer. This will be sitting somewhere in the cellar in the basement of some big agency. Maybe five, ten years later, we will see, oh, somebody has publicly built a quantum computer. But that's different. And one problem is, once the quantum computer is there, you cannot do any more updates. You actually need the signature in place before something comes. So actually, if you roll out something today, and Mikko was mentioning cars where he wants to have them for 20, 30 years. So if you're building anything where you have long-term security, you must actually today get your signatures in place so you can do code updates the moment that somebody is concerned enough about a quantum computer. So at that moment, you actually need to have a post-quantum secure signature system. Now, I mentioned that we finally got some money, so, well, we've been doing our worth of money, so some people got together, including me, and we wrote some recommendations, so it's not that we are just saying, hmm, you know, there's a problem, we don't know how to solve it. We actually have some recommendations, and the first few lines should look kind of familiar to you. So the first few lines are crypto systems that we now use, but we need to use with larger keys. So that's the effect of this Scrover attack that I had on a previous slide saying Grover's attack. So we can actually um, upgrade our systems with not too much effort. You will not much need, um, you will not much use extra power, you will not use much more time, you will not notice it. Also, authenticity, authenticity with symmetric cryptography, that's fine. But the real problem is public key cryptography. So, one example we have where we're very confident. So, if you really want to use 
public key cryptography now that is secure against a quantum computer, then our recommendation is to use a system due to uh, Robert McLeese from the late 70s. So this has been around for a long time. This has aged really well. We have lots of people who looked at this. We have people who looked at this with the might of a quantum attack. We have looked at this with normal classical attacks. And we're pretty sure that nothing's going to happen. But there's a little problem, namely the key size. A one megabyte key is nothing you will casually send over the internet. So we can help you, but you don't want to roll this out unless you need to. For signatures, the situation is a little bit, uh, bit better. We have some systems which are currently considered by the ITF for, well, its last call for an RFC in the CFIG. Um, but also there, the signature size will go up. To give a little detail of how this works, so this MacLeese crypto system is something based on coding theory. You have seen this most likely in error correcting code, so if you're looking at error correcting RAM, then there you have something where you have some information, you're doing redundancy, so you're increasing the information you have just in case some bits get flipped. So here's an example. We have a big matrix A. We call these things a parity check matrix. And coding theory over the years has found lots of codes, meaning lots of such matrices, where the, um, the system or the, the question that they're solving is, I give you a long vector times this matrix. And this matrix is more wide than high. So you're losing information. But I tell you that this long vector that I had didn't have many ones was almost all zeros. And then for good matrices, for good H values, we know how to construct, to reconstruct this E. For random matrices, we don't have anything efficient. So there is a difference in complexity between a nice matrix, something coding theories have studied, and random matrices, where coding theories have spent lots of time in trying to develop better algorithms, but all of them take a long, long time. So what Codebase Crypto is doing is using this difference in complexity for encryption. And then there is some way of kind of doing a trapdoor to take a good matrix and hide it in one which looks very random. Now that's an example of Codebase Cryptography and we use a particular type, namely GOPA codes in this. There's lots of stuff else going on in post-quantum cryptography. There are other codes which on the surface at this level of detail look the same way that I just explained, but in detail they're very, very different. They have lots of little differences in the algorithm, how to do them securely, how to do them fast. Then there's totally different things. You might hear a lot about lattice-based cryptography and one of the oldest systems being Entrue. So that's from the 90s as well. Um, this has been an ISO standard. Some people have used it, but it's still not widespread. But the good news is, if you're using this, it is very likely secure against a quantum computer. What we don't know exactly is how secure it is. If you're now asking me, how secure is this parameter set? I go like, well, caution, it's at least this secure. We need much more research to really understand whether it's this secure or this secure or this secure. What we currently can give you is paranoid recommendations. We can tell you something which will be good for sure, but we cannot give you the exact security. And then there's many other systems. Some are more exotic, some need more research. So it's something, well, join us, jump in. There's lots of stuff to be done. Thank you. Yeah.